Today we're going to talk about cobalt strike, why you're hearing so much about it in the news and what kind of detection opportunities it presents for you. Hi, my name is Dan Brett, I'm the CSO of Countercraft and I'm here talking with David Barroso, our CEO. Hi David. Hi Dan, how are you? Really good, thanks. Okay, so cobalt strike, um, why was it originally built by the security community? David. Well, I think Cobalt Strike was uh, created back in 2012, more or less, uh, by a security researcher in, in the US, but was more like a trying to replace Metasploit, Metaperter, starting with a visual Wii. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the initial origin of Cobalt Strike. So they wanted to have a visual uh, application for using Metasploit. But then, of course, they, they detected that there was a good opportunity of improving many things that Metasploit was doing at the time. Okay, so I'm a security researcher using Cobalt Strike, and what is it I'm doing, you know? So Cobalt Strike mainly is a post-exploitation tool. So usually use that right. after exploiting or compromising your target. So you can then move laterally, try to uh, pivot to different machines, try to escalate privileges, or, so you can do lots of things, but always post-exploitation. So I guess this is a really good tool for like red teamers, maybe people doing complex pen tests. So why has it suddenly become popular in the criminal community? Yeah, I, I guess the red teamers love Cobalt Strike, no? because it's so cool, it's very useful, lots of different features. Mm -hmm. But what happens is that also threat actors and the criminals also love that, because it's right. such a good tool for post-exploitation purposes that, of course, they are using that. And the, the issue is that, of course, there are many cracked versions in the internet that you can find very easily. So those criminals are using pirate version of Cobalt Strikes. Right, so they're not paying the Cobalt Strike company for their tool, no? They're no. just ripping off and using these tools for security researchers that are out there. Sure, yeah, of course, uh, Cobalt Strike is an American company, and of course they control the person that is buying right. Cobalt Strike, so of course they don't sell to criminal okay. brands, yeah. So this makes me think, like, it's a great tool for the security community to examine, you know, whatever, your network infrastructures, your websites, and make them more secure. But the criminals are taking advantage of it. So do you reckon this makes us more or less secure? Uh, that's a nice question. There is a lot of discussion in the internet. If you go on Twitter, there are people that are against uh, right. the release of exploits or security tools to the community and people that are totally for that. No? Like, because I'm more th thinking that, uh, of course, if you are a defender, if you are a blue team, those new exploits, new security tools that are released are very helpful for you because you can check if you are vulnerable, you can check uh, right. what's happening inside the organization, outside the organization. So for me, they are very helpful. But other people think that are very dangerous. Okay. Yeah, now I can see this debate on both sides. I know this has gone back a long way yes. in the security community. But it's good to see that you're there you're thinking that being open about research and stuff is a good thing for the community in general. I see that too. So in that vein, what can I do? What kind of detection opportunities have I got against something as configurable and like, you know, well engineered as Cobalt Strike, yeah. what can we do? Oh, that also is a good question. Then. <laughs> uh, I guess the, the, the biggest feature that Cobalt Strike has is that you can tailor and tune all the different settings. You have profiles for the control panel, you can change the behavior of the, uh, the first stage, uh, like a malware that you're going to execute. You can change everything. Uh, mm -hmm. So, But um, there are some detection opportunities. I would say that there are three detection opportunities. Okay. The first one is uh, by searching the internet or scanning the internet looking for Cobalt Strike servers mm -hmm. because uh, they, some of them are easy to find. They use uh, default ports, they use <coughs> default TLS certificates, uh, so more or less it's easy to find Cobalt Strike servers in the internet so you can just monitor communications going to those servers. So that's one detection opportunity if they are using one of those. So kind of having a list of websites inside of your you know, detection infrastructure to see if anyone's talking to these well-known Cobalt Strike servers. That's correct. Yeah. Okay, got it. That's the first one. So the second one is that, of course, Cobalt Strike uses, uh, uh, uses beacons. That is a small component that is, is installed in the endpoints of the server so that mm -hmm. you can execute code and use that beacon for moving laterally. So those beacons are connecting back to the control panel Right. Uh, by default, every six seconds, but of course you can change the settings, have jitter, uh, so it can be random 65, the next one will 54, but you can try to analyze the data sniffing the traffic and checking if the, there is any endpoint or server, server connecting back to the control panel every sing number of seconds. So uh, using machine learning, by using uh, different tools, you can try to detect traffic. Network traffic, great. Okay, yeah. so we've got internet service, network traffic, anything else? 
Yeah, the last one is in the endpoint itself or okay. in the server itself. Uh, also, Cobalt Strike uses lots of named pipes. Uh, they use uh, named pipes for uh, executing commands, for using Samba beacons, lots of stuff. Uh, so by default, there are some names uh, that you can check for those named pipes. Mm -hmm. So you can try to find those names, and of course, that will be another detection opportunity. Hang on, but if I'm a criminal, you said it was very configurable. Wouldn't I just change the names, the name pipes, if I was trying to like hide my tracks? Yeah, that's a, another good question, and uh, I guess that because if we talk about operational security, if imagine you are a threat actor, uh -huh. if you change your settings every time you are compromising a company, right? Perhaps you, the blue team, the defenders can link incidents because we are using the same settings or similar settings, but they can see that is the same group behind so you those mean attacks. The very way I configure the tool might tell you who I am. Correct. Okay. So, so how can I stop that? So what we are seeing is that the majority of threat actors, they use by default settings. Because then you cannot know if it's a, I don't know, APT X or criminal gun Y, because it's just everything by default. There is nothing changed. So either a very basic attacker or a very complex one will use the, ver the very default settings. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. That's smart, yeah. But in that way, you've got a, an easy 60-second beacon. That could be one simple thing. It's a good detection opportunity then. Yeah. Okay. And so, I guess, you know, I mean, and, and how do I even know it's popular? Is there any way of checking, you know, can I, can I check this to see if bad people really do use Cobalt Strike? Yeah. For instance, we love a website that is the DFIR report. The DFIR report. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so, they publish lots of uh, incidents regarding usually ransomware. Yeah. So if you check those blog posts, I guess more than 90% of those blog posts are using Cobalt Strike as a post exploitation tool. So definitely it's very popular. That's great. So coffee time reading, check DFIR, and you'll find out that these things really are real. We've run over some great ways to kind of look into detecting for it. David, thanks for talking to us about Cobalt Strike, and I yeah. hope um, it gets everyone more prepared for these kind of threats in the real world. <laughs>